Hi, my name is Albert Wanyo. You are welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to discuss what communication is, the elements, the forms, the barriers, and how to overcome them. So let's start with what communication is. Communication is the transfer of information from a sender to a receiver. And that transfer is a process. It is a process that involves the exchange of meaning. So let's look at the elements of communication. In the process, the process involves these elements. The elements are the sender of the information. The sender is the speaker, the person who initiates the communication process. And when the communication process is initiated, what is sent is the information. So the other element of communication is the information or the message that is sent. Now, the information that is sent passes through a medium or a channel. And when it passes through the medium, then it gets to the destination or the receiver. And for communication to be complete, anytime the receiver receives the information, the receiver gives feedback or response. So the feedback or the response gets back to the sender. So these are the elements. Now let's look at the language skills involved in the communication process. There are basically four language skills, and this is the order in which they are acquired. The first language skill that we all acquire is listening. So when a baby is born, the first language skill the baby acquires is the ability to listen and distinguish between sounds. Then, after some time, that child learns to speak. So the next language skill is speaking. Then, when we grow to a certain age, six or five, we go to school. Then we have to learn how to read. So the next language skill is reading. And after reading, we have writing. So basically four language skills. Now let's look at how we can classify these language skills. The ones that we use to produce the information are the ones that we speak. The ones that we use to receive is through listening. So listening and reading, which are used to receive information, are referred to as the receptive language skills. And the ones we use to produce the information, that is by speaking or by writing, are the productive language skills. Great. Then apart from that, we can classify these four language skills into what we call the primary language skills and the secondary language skills. The primary language skills are the ones that we acquire, every well-formed child acquires that. That's listening and speaking. Then we have the secondary language skills that we acquire through formal education. That is reading and writing. Great. Let's look at the forms of communication. We have basically two. That is verbal communication, which is the use of words or the use of language. And verbal communication can be written or spoken. Then we have the non-verbal communication, which involves the use of no words. So words are not used or language is not used. And this is where we have gestures or sometimes pictures or graphic that communicates without language. Now, when it comes to the non-verbal communication, where words are not used, we can put them into types like this. Kinesics is the use of gestures. You know, we use gestures like beckoning somebody or directing somebody to do something or nodding our head, shaking our head. All these use of body parts to communicate is what we call kinesics. Then we have haptics. Haptics is how we use touch to communicate. That we do handshake, and these days, we say we should not shake our hands because of coronavirus, so we do what? The poser, right? Yes, the high five, we hug, 
with kids, all these are haptic communication, communication by using the word touch. Then we also have oculistics, which is how we communicate by using eye contact. Okay, eye contact. You know, even when you are addressing audience, there is the need for you to maintain some level of eye contact. When you're talking to somebody, it is ideal to maintain eye contact, not be looking away from the person. So we use eye contact to communicate. Then we have chronemics. That is how time communicates. Chronemics. The time at which an event takes place communicates something. There is time that is appropriate for you to maybe call somebody, and there is time that is not appropriate to call. So even our lateness to function communicates something about us. Then we have proxemics. Proxemics is how distance communicates. And the distance between the two communicators also communicates something. For example, if a younger person stands far away from an elderly person and just throw the words, that will be seen as what? Well, being disrespectful. So how far you are away from the person, they communicate disrespect. Then we can also have instances where the two uh, interlocutors are so close that it may communicate intimacy, right? Then we have objectives. Objectives is how the things we wear, the things we have around us communicate. If you have a ring, it communicates something. So you have a lady, you have an eye, and one day you see her wearing a wedding ring, that communicates to you that now you are blocked, you can't go there anymore. You see somebody in black throughout, then, hey, what has happened? Are you believed? Uh -huh. So the way we dress, the things we wear, the earrings, the rings, the necklace, etc., even the perfumes we wear, all these communicate about us. You can see somebody who is a corporate person, you can see somebody who is a laborer from the way they dress. Great. Then, in addition to that, we also have what we call vocalics. Vocalics is from the vocal cord, but it is not word or language. So you can cough. You can cough in a way that communicates. Yawning communicates. So stress, uh, uh, high pitch or shouting, all these communicate something. Right? Great. Now, let's look at the types of communication. Types of communication. We have basically three or four types. We have the first one we call the intrapersonal. Look at how it is spelled, intrapersonal. And that is communication within an individual. And there is argument that yes, individuals communicate within themselves. So that is intrapersonal. Then we have the interpersonal communication. And interpersonal communication is communication that takes place between two or more people. So it can be between two people. When it is between two people, we say it is dialectic communication. Then it can also be between three to six people, and that is a small group communication. Then we have public communication. Public communication is where we have one person delivering maybe a lecture or addressing a large group of people, like what we have in the lecture hall is a public communication. Church service is a public communication. Maybe a political rally is public communication. Then we have mass communication, where we have from a single source to a large number of audience that you cannot see. They are unseen. For example, mass communication usually takes place on the radio or via the internet or on the television. And usually, mass communication may be monolinear. What do we mean by monolinear? Monolinear simply means from one source. There is no feedback. Okay? So when it is, for example, you are watching news on a TV, that is monolinear. There's no way you can give feedback. Okay? Great. Then, we can also have communication to be bilinear. Interpersonal communication is usually bilinear because when you are in a conversation with a friend, you will talk and you will give you feedback. That, so once there is feedback, then it is what? Bilinear. And if you have a small group that all people can talk and listen at the same time, uh, somebody takes 10, it is multilinear. So 
communication can be monolinear, bilinear, or multilinear. But let me add that sometimes we can have a mass communication, yet there will be opportunity for the listeners or viewers to call into the program. The telephone number is made available. Then in that case, then we will say it is a bilinear mass communication. So if we have radio lecture and you can call into the radio lecture and ask questions, though that is mass communication, it is bilinear. So we'll say it is bilinear mass communication. Is that okay? Great. Now let's look at the barriers to effective communication. Now, barriers here refer to anything that serves as a hindrance or a blockade to the communication process. Either block how to send information or how information is received. So we have physical barriers. Physical barrier refers to what is in the environment, like noise, poor lighting. So that's like that when somebody is on, on the board, a student maybe cannot read well because of poor lighting. All these things constitute physical barrier. Then we have the psychological barrier. The psychological barrier has to do with the emotion of the person, the emotional state of the person as to whether the person is angry, whether the person is happy, the person is sad at the time of communication. If the person is uh, sad at the time of communication, that can affect communication. So that can be a barrier. Then we have the linguistic barrier or the language barrier. And linguistic barrier here refers to something like differences in language. So that if the sender is speaking a particular language that the receiver does not understand, that is a language barrier. And it can also be, a language barrier can also be that though they're speaking the same language, the sender is using words or terminologies that the receiver does not understand. Then we also have transmission barrier, which has to do with internet connectivity or cabling, etc. Then prejudice. Prejudice as a barrier to communication has to do with the individual. How the individual perceives a group of people, maybe negatively, and as a result of that, any member of that group is perceived as negative and therefore information from that individual is maybe not received, that becomes a barrier. Now, how do we overcome the barriers to communication? For the physical barrier, we need to minimize noise in our environment and improve on the lighting system, maybe in the classroom. Psychological barrier, we need to ensure, especially because we are dealing with learners, that they are in the right mood. You don't let them get angry before you start teaching, so that that would be a barrier. Then a linguistic barrier is for us to avoid the use of maybe uh, jargons or expressions or vocabulary that people are not familiar with. Okay, great. Then the transmission barrier is to check, maybe it, it, sometimes it may be beyond us, but if it is about cables, we can rearrange and reconnect. Then prejudice is to avoid looking at people from a negative perspective. Great. So that is the discussion for today. Thank you for listening.